Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. And that breaking news is happening right now in Superior Township, where we've learned a Washtenaw County Sheriff's deputy has been shot while responding to a shooting. And now police have surrounded a home near Lakeview Court in the area of North Prospect and Clark Road, telling everyone in that area to stay inside. All right, let's get right after Jason Colthorpe off the top here at 5. Jason, you just got an update. Yeah, we did. And uh, that officer, we should let everyone know, is stable right now at the hospital. Uh, but if you look behind me, you can see several of the units who are out here heading back now. A few moments ago, a heavily armed police vehicle came into this subdivision. To give you a little idea where we are, we're at Oak Brook subdivision, right at the, at the uh, front of it, about a mile away. Uh, with this winds to the back is where the scene is and it's uh, it looks like it's an apartment complex that's behind this subdivision. The police chopper is still overhead. We can hear that, but several of these units have come back. Uh, we're waiting for an update on that, but basically what happened uh, a couple of hours ago now, uh, shots were fired between neighbors uh, and when police showed up answering that call, that's when the man started firing at police hitting the one deputy who was then rushed to the hospital and then he barricaded himself inside. Here's what police had to say about an hour ago. Around 2 11 p.m. we received a call of a neighbor dispute that a neighbor had shot at another neighbor so we had deputies responding to a felonious assault. Um, not exactly sure the time frame but as soon as deputies arrived not long after they uh, took gunfire uh, one of our deputies was actually struck um, was transported to a local hospital. Um, he is uh, in stable condition at the moment. Um, and we're just waiting for continuous uh, medical updates. Now, again, the next update we're waiting for is what has happened in the last few moments. Uh, the police chopper is still overhead. And from Sky 4, from our pictures earlier, you can see just how big this scene is. Uh, this might be the biggest scene I've ever been on. I've more agencies than I can name. But ATF, MSP, SWAT teams, two sheriff's departments, several police departments, all convening here. And again, to give you an idea, I'm about a mile away from the actual scene. And this whole road going back is all lined with police vehicles, not to mention police vehicles out on the road coming in here. And again, we see we see that the police chopper is still overhead. We know they're negotiating with this man inside over the last hour or so. No more shots have been fired at police as far as police have told us. We'll keep you updated as to how this all shakes out when it's over. We're live in the Superior Township. Jason Colthorpe, Local 4. We sure will. Keep it right here for updates through this next 90 minutes of news. Sorry, right, Jason. Our other top story at 5. The Big Ten reverses course and votes to restart the fall football season. Games now set to resume October 23rd with stringent testing protocols in place. Our coverage here at 5 now starts with Bernie. Bernie. Devin, uh, it sounds almost like the Big Ten's given itself a mulligan, a do-over, a we thought it over and we were just kidding. You remember back in August, August 11th to be exact, they moved the football season to the spring. Today the conference announced due to rapid testing for COVID, they will play a nine-game schedule beginning the weekend of October 24th. We've got highlights, and the season will end on December 19th with the Big Ten title game. Why December 19th? Because the next day the final rankings come out for the national playoffs, and the Big Ten could still qualify. Commissioner Kevin Warren says he feels good with the health protocol in place. It's been an interesting year, but the good thing about where we are today, I always ask myself, are we better today than we were yesterday and are we better today than we were 43 days ago? And the answer is unequivocally yes. We're better as a conference. We're better as a people. And that's why I'm comfortable to go forward and uh, return to competition. All right. I also, though, there will be no fans at any of these games except possibly for some family members. That's still being decided. Money. Big factor here, Michigan might have lost over $100 million in their athletic budget, so that was a big factor here. And pressure from players, uh, coaches, players, parents, and politicians to make this thing possible. Standing by live at the Big House with a reaction from the students and everyone on campus is Rod Maloney. Good evening, Rod. Good evening, Bernie. You know, I'm thinking donuts here, and that may sound bizarre, but the fact of the matter is you talk to people here on campus, and they're walking around as if there was this giant hole in the middle of their lives, the lack of football. And now that football is restored, oh, they're smiling. 
Michigan football has been a century long constant here in Ann Arbor. Heck, even during the 1918 Spanish flu, they played five games. So the news they're getting back the season everyone thought they'd lost is making students like Michael Bernstein of Long Island. Pretty excited. Can't wait. I, we wanted it here from the beginning, so I'm happy they finally pulled the trigger and uh, let us uh, play now. So I mean, I'm pretty excited for it. You know, I like grew up watching football here, so can't really imagine a a year gone by without having it. Yeah, I'll be happy. Obviously, without fans, it'll be different, but at least it'll give us something to watch. <laughs> U of M football's current trademark is the unbridled passion coach Jim Harbaugh brings to the field he played on for Bo Schembechler. His statement today read, quote, great news today. Over the past month, I could sense the anticipation from our players and coaches, and I'm thrilled on their behalf that they'll have a chance to play a 2020 season. Stay positive, test negative, let's play football. A uh, fitting rallying cry for the pigskin deprived, like student Mike Workmeister, who looked around and saw Southern schools playing. But having the, the football atmosphere around is going to be huge because I know a lot of the other schools, everything has changed, but they still have football, whereas here we're sitting here not knowing what to do almost. If we can bring small groups together to watch the games, which I think is a good opportunity to get together in those small groups. And so Mark Schlissel, who was the president here at the university, also put out a statement today. And uh, he said that he was glad to see uh, football returning. And he also said that he was glad to see that they were able to figure out a medical program or a protocol that made it so that he could feel safe to allow the athletes here at Michigan, at the University of Michigan, back onto the football field. Reporting live in Ann Arbor, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right, Rod. So let's turn now I'm to Dr. On right now. Yes, you are. Let's turn to Dr. Frank McGeorge. Uh, Doc, there are a number of new rules on when players can return to activity after they have been diagnosed. So 21 days would be right now the earliest that a player can return. Yeah, that's really just consistent with the recommendations by a number of physician organizations. Keep in mind, though, that the 21 days assumes there are no complications and that there is an uneventful course. If a player develops a complication like myocarditis, for example, they would actually be out for many, many months. Yeah, yeah. and speaking of that, uh, Dr. McGeorge, how are Big Ten schools specifically screening COVID-positive players for any heart problems? Well, so they're going to be doing blood work, specific cardio, cardiac biomarkers, EKGs, as well as an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. But on top of that, they are doing cardiac MRI. Now, the cardiac MRI part is especially cutting edge, given the recent study from Ohio State University that shows that it may actually prove useful in identifying cardiac inflammation from COVID very early on. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Dr. McGeorge, we appreciate it very much. Well, today the state reports 680 new cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed in the past 24 hours. Along with that, 11 more Michiganders have passed away from the virus. At the governor's briefing today, the state's top medical executive said a two-month-old little baby in Michigan has died from the virus. Dr. John A. Caldoun says case rates in the Detroit area are dropping, but cases are going up in spots such as Lansing, Kalamazoo, and Grand Rapids. And she attributes that to outbreaks on college campuses. The governor says she supports the push for all Michigan State students to quarantine. It's gatherings that of young people around campuses that are fueling a lot of the growth that we're seeing. So I commend the Ingham County Health Department for the action that they've taken, working in conjunction with Michigan State University. Dr. Caldoun says bars will likely remain closed to prevent further outbreaks. And with 48 days until the election, Help Me Hank is working to make sure your vote counts. And today, the governor and secretary of state spoke out about how and when you can vote. And they also voiced big concerns about counting the record number of absentee ballots expected. Seemed like the lion's share of the briefing really today was about voting. Our consumer investigator, Hank Winchester, going to be paying close attention to the voting process. And Hank, Secretary Benson uh, remains worried uh, despite uh, the bill passing the Senate yesterday. Devin, she's very concerned and insiders will tell you she has every right to be worried because as you mentioned, we could look at a record turnout regarding absentee voters for November and the state of Michigan simply may not be ready.
The clock is ticking in the outcome expected to be record-breaking in Michigan. We're closing in on the November election, and we could see huge numbers, many voting absentee. Our overall turnout will likely exceed 5 million, and we're also on track to have more people voting prior to Election Day than ever before. There are more options than ever before to make your voice heard. You can begin voting September 24th at your local clerk's office. That's also the day absentee ballots will begin to be mailed out. Of course, if that's not your thing, no worries. The polls will be open on Election Day despite the pandemic. And precautions are being taken to make sure everyone is safe. You have a right to have your ballot mailed to you. Mailing your ballot is a really good option, especially for those who have voted by mail in the past and are familiar with the procedures, or for those who may be at risk or have concerns about voting in person. The worry now, counting all those absentee ballots and getting results quickly. The Senate has passed a measure allowing clerks to begin processing absentee ballots the day before the election. And while the governor says it's a step in the right direction, Secretary Benson said she needs more time. States like Florida, Kentucky, North Carolina, Ohio, and many others have additional days and time that go beyond the 10 hours granted in the legislation passed yesterday. Back out here live, so the secretary hoping that she does get extra time, but again, the clock is ticking. This all has to happen very quickly, and as a result of everything going on, including obviously the pandemic, we know many of you have concerns about making your vote count, and that's why we are doing everything to help ensure that you are able to vote safely and effectively this fall. If you have any questions or issues regarding the process, we encourage you to reach out to the Help Me Hank team. We're going to be tracking problems uh, throughout the election cycle and any issues to help make sure that all of you have an opportunity to vote. Again, if you have any issues or concerns, just reach out to me directly. We're live here tonight. Hank Winchester, help me, Hank. All right, Hank. A barricaded gunman situation that stretched on for more than 24 hours is over with the gunman dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Police spent all night trying to get the man to come out of the home on Iliad Street on Detroit's west side. Our Victor Williams shows us how it all unfolded. Well, this is the outcome that police tried so hard to avoid. That's part of the reason why they were out here standing off for so long, nearly two days. And as you can see right behind me, they're still looking inside the home of the gunman for any evidence. This man thought that it would be better to take his life than to go into custody. Uh, we want him to come out peacefully. Uh, we're not looking to hurt him. That was the mindset of police hoping to get the gunman to surrender overnight. To their advantage, one of the hostages was able to escape a little before four in the morning. Looks like the uh, suspect fell asleep and he ran out the front door. Those actions seem to level the playing field for the police who now have the upper hand. So once the hostage escaped, you know, he no longer had the leverage. It was just a matter of time whether he turned himself in, surrendered, or we came in to get him. Officers from multiple departments, including Dearborn and Redford, then worked to make their way inside. We uh, cleared the blinds from one of the windows with uh, with our Bearcat. Um, at that point, officers heard a pop. The 38-year-old suspect named Thomas Curry, nicknamed Crazy, turning the gun on himself and taking his own life. And even though it was never proven in court, police are certain this was the person behind June's unsolved triple homicide on the east side. He didn't have a trial, but in our mind, he's definitely the right guy. Now, most of this area here on Iliad was blocked off as officers tried to do what they could to get this man out. But as you guys can see, it is now opening back up once again. Victor Williams, Local 4. Sure is. All right, more ahead here at 5. Yeah, let's check in with Andrew. And Kimberly and Devin still feels like summer out there as we look at downtown Detroit at Comerica Park. Baseball is in town tonight and we have temperatures in the upper 70s, but it gets cooler. That part of your forecast and an update on Sally coming up. Next at 515, the local four defenders, we have uncovered new video of a horrible homicide that took place in Highland Park. We're also hearing from the victim's mother. Don't get it wrong. We're not coming after nobody because one day you're going to get caught. That victim was disabled. We also have a clear picture of the person police are after. And we continue to follow breaking news in Superior Township, which is where a Washtenaw County Sheriff's deputy was shot while responding to a shooting. We're told the officer is in the hospital in stable condition right now. The gunman has now barricaded himself inside a home. Police have the home surrounded. They are telling everyone in the area to stay inside. We'll keep covering it 
and we'll be right back. <laughs> 